We talked about this. It's kind of neat. I didn't think it would be this neat, but it's pretty neat. So there's this thing we have called uh, snow to go. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, I thought, eh, it's a novelty thing, but we've been playing with it. It's like there's nothing there until you put water on it. And it just starts to grow. And it kind of lasts for weeks and weeks. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, it. Yeah. I don't know. it you know, it's kind of cool. It's not cold or anything, it's cool. But <laughs> it just keeps on getting bigger and bigger. And my daughter said last year, she bought, she ordered them because she was playing with it last year at a party and they were making snowballs. And <laughs> the only thing bad is if you get too much on the ground, it's a little slick. Oh, no. But other than that, it's... Uh, Have you, like, I don't know if you could use that to spray, like, artificial plants and spray some glue on it and sprinkle that on it for, you know, like snow effect. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what happens if it gets really dry. It'll probably just shrink again. But uh, it has to stay moist. Yeah. But it can stay moist for a long time. So. Did you let it dry out when you were experimenting with it? Well, we just started using a couple of weeks ago, and we have a sample over there that's still wet, still wet. Okay. <laughs> after a couple of weeks. So. Well, we'll start. Uh, people at home aren't going to be able to see the, <laughs> the class today. The internet just went boop. This went out. Okay. YouTube. And we have it streaming on YouTube. Yeah. Okay, so today is going to be roses. And generally, uh, roses, you can make them as. You know, they're not as popular as they were in the 80s and 90s. 80s and 90s were kind of like their heyday when uh, the largest grower in the world at that time was Jackson Perkins. They were actually growing 20 million roses a year at their facility, and they were at that time, they were in California. Now they're kind of disappeared. Uh, they're on the East Coast. Uh, I think they're contract growing with some other growers. They don't have their own facility anymore. So that the rose industry has shrunk. So they were selling maybe 40, 50 million roses per year in the US back in the 80s and 90s. And now we're down to maybe less than 10 million, something like that. So, uh, but they're still among the most popular shrubs sold. I mean, if they're still selling that many, that's a lot of plants. So it's still real popular, but not as, you know, what, what happened, I think, is they got a bad name because of maintenance and pesticide use. Um, but, you know, in my own, now I'll admit, back in the 80s, I didn't want a single problem with my roses. So that required a lot of spraying, almost weekly spraying at times of the year with some of the really uh, harsh chemicals to keep them spotless. But when I had kids, got married, had kids, I had pets, the roses took a back seat, and I hardly sprayed them at all, and they look 80, 90 percent as good. So we don't, you know, so you can say, well, roses, you can make them as hard or as easy as you want. Um, they don't seem to die from a uh, lack of spraying. They just don't look as good for that moment. Um, that said, there are a couple new pests and diseases around there that can cause a lot of trouble, so we'll talk about those. So anyway, roses, um, the classic one that most people want 
is the single flowered, the big flowered ones. Now we sold 95% uh, of all our roses, so all I have left to show you. Uh, this is a pillar rose, which is a plant that can be used as a bush or a climber. And I have a tree rose, but we pretty much sold everything else and I didn't want to pick my neighbor's flowers this morning, so uh, I don't have a good one to show you. But the regular florist rose is considered a hybrid tea. So big single flowers, one on a stem, that's the classic rose, that's what most people want when they buy a rose plant from the yard. Um, hybrid teas tend to grow about uh, let's say four to five foot tall, three foot wide would be typical. So generally when you space roses in the garden, the closest you want to go is three feet apart <clears throat> and the further is actually better. Now hybrid tea is, uh, is not because it's, well, they combined two roses back in the 1800s to make it. So they took a rose called a hybrid perpetual from China and crossed it with a tea rose from China to get the hybrid teas. Uh, I don't know where the term hybrid perpetual came from, if someone actually hybridized to get that one or not but the tea roses bloomed year round. The hybrid perpetuals had the real nice petals. So when they combined the two, they got um, a rose that bloomed repeatedly over the year. Uh, and in other words, they never stopped growing flowers. And uh, they've got the nice big flowers. Uh, back in the 1920s, they crossed this with a real small flower called a uh, polyantha rose. Uh, to get a shorter version of hybrid tea we call Floribunda. So hybrid teas, single flowers. Floribunda is generally because the polyantha roses had big sprays of flowers. These generally have small sprays of medium-sized flowers on a shorter plant. So this would be your um, Floribunda. So these are the two most popular roses out there, Floribunda hybrid tea. Floribunda's uh, three to four foot would be average height, three foot wide, average width. And generally, uh, we like to use, we recommend Floribunda's as a front yard, front of the bed plant. Hybrid teas, either backyard, side yard, or behind the Floribunda's because they get so tall and they're kind of leggy at the bottom. We gotta admit, the uh, hybrid teas getting a bit leggy, whereas Floribunda's are so low that uh, they look better in the landscape. Um, the tree roses like this one, what they've done is just taken a stem from a climber, stake it up, and then graft branches from another rose on top of it. Now this happens to be a Floribunda grafted twice on top of the stem uh, to make this tree rose. This one has a 36 inch trunk. They make them with 24 inch trunks and with 18 inch trunks. Um, they always have to be supported with the stake because roses really don't grow real strong trunks. This is a stem of a climber so if you were to uh, take the stake off slowly would go like this. So. so there's no quote real tree rose. We have to make those artificially. Um, but with the three foot trunk, you really couldn't stick it in with the hybrid tea. They would grow together, but you could put it in perhaps with the Floribunda because they'll have their head like this or with just other plants. Most tree roses are used uh, in a grass lawn. But there's nothing below it. And then the, uh, this pillar rose, they call it pillar. It's an upright plant, but it can grow six foot or taller, just straight up. And it can also be spread out along a fence and grown as a, as a climber against the fence. Uh, the other, most climbing roses will grow, st or more lax, they'll grow out like that and grow stems up to 10 foot long. Usually it's around seven to 10 foot for most climbers. Now the original roses we had, and still some of the climbers do this too, mainly bloom in spring. 
um, pretty much over a three to five month period. So when they start growing in the spring, they start blooming and they continue until the spring growth is over, which is usually early summer. So it can be, uh, so some of the famous ones are some English roses, uh, some of the old garden roses, they would bloom from about March or April to about June or July and then stop and that'd be it for the year. Cecile Bruner is one of those famous ones. Um, the biggest rose in the world is, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it now. It's in, it's in Tucson. There's a rose that covers an area probably bigger than this room uh, over an eating area at a, at a fast food place. But it's a um, Lady Banks rose. And Lady Banks roses are thornless, which makes them popular um, for use along fence lines. They only bloom once a year, but they are highly subject to mildew, which is a big problem in Orange County. So, not so much in Riverside or Tucson. Um, miniatures are actually developed quite recently. They only became popular, I think, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, they were f kind of discovered in California by, um, I can't remember the guy's name now. He was up in uh, Central Valley, and he made the miniatures famous. And miniatures generally stay below two foot and have flowers two inches or less in diameter. That's what, the problem we have in California is that, you know, if you're on, if you're in New York, Miniature roses, you can put along your edge of your lawn and they grow this big during the year. In California, most miniatures can make it to three feet. <laughs> they just get too big. So they don't do what uh, we want them to do here. They're just, we're just too vigorous. In fact, like there's another category of roses called the English roses. Well, the English roses, um, people like the way the English, the uh, old fashioned roses look. They like, you know. so the, Modern roses that most of the rose growers now sell, especially the hybrid teas, are this is called the hybrid tea form or modern. They call this um, pointed bud, a uh, uh, very tight center. Whereas this form would be more of the old fashioned rose. So for many, many decades in, in California, they only wanted to grow this rose and they discarded all the rest. Well, uh, the rose breeders weren't open-minded. So when consumers started seeing English roses that look like this, they said, oh, we'll buy those English roses instead. So now the American breeders know that this isn't the only shape that people like. They'll take the uh, ones without the center also. So. And this one you'd call, this is almost a quartered flower where there's divided into four sections. Uh, but the old garden roses were like that. Well, the original old garden roses just bloomed in the spring. But David Austin in England uh, decided he would breed um, the English roses so that they would bloom over and over and over. And he developed his own famous line of roses. Uh, in England, they grew about three by three, and then when they brought them to California, they suddenly grew ten by ten, and so they had to do a whole, you know, they had to make a whole new set for California. <laughs> All the stuff in England that was real tiny and grew one foot, brought it here and it grew three feet, four foot. So we haven't carried too many of the David Austin roses in the last few years, only because they stopped selling uh, through other growers, and now they're selling only by, from their own nursery. They started a nursery in, 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 of all places, Tyler, Texas, which is the rose capital of Texas. So they sent them out from there. But it's such a uh, different, like our rose growers are all in the Central Valley, California. And they do that because it's nice and hot and dry in the summer, no diseases. But in November every year, it suddenly gets cool. It gets real humid in there. They get that what is called Thule fog. So what they do is they can go through their fields, they, they grow the rose in the ground uh, for uh, two years, and then they just plow them out of the ground and pick them up and stack them and store them and put them in their warehouses. 
but because it's so foggy up there, yeah, they can just plow the field and leave them out there and they don't dry up. Uh, so that's almost a perfect place to grow them now. In Tyler, Texas, I'm not sure how they work it there, but they don't harvest those because it's too cold in the winter. So they just harvest them come uh, March. So the David Austin roses are sent out across the country in March, whereas our growers start, they've already dug them up and they're processing them and we'll be getting them in just a matter of 10 days. Uh, we get one shipment in 10 days, another shipment, uh, I believe a few days after that. So uh, uh, in California, so California has been the ideal spot for a lot of rose growers to be. Um, it used to be that the three big ones in the U.S., Jackson Perkins, Star Roses, which is now the biggest in the world, and Weeks Roses were all neighbors up in the Central Valley, south of Fresno, near a place called Wasco. So that's supposed to be the best climate to grow them for, for their purpose, bare root roses. Okay, um, let's go over planting. So bare root's kind of different. So container plants, just like any other container plant, and roses fortunately are real tolerant of poor conditions. So you can just dig a hole in the ground and stick this in the dirt water it good and feed it and it's going to grow. Um, they're not that sensitive to clay. Uh, they like, you know, ideal soil for rose. You know, if you're a florist rose grower, a lot of florist rose, roses are grown in pure sand. Because in sand, they'll get the longest stems. Now, I would not recommend pure sand for you unless you want a 10 foot tall rose bush because that's what they do. One of our customers, a uh, longtime customer, said he was in Saudi Arabia as an oil consultant for a decade, and he, was, he had a trailer parked on the sand in Saudi Arabia, and he wanted, he missed his roses, so he planted them in the sand. People told him, you're crazy, they, they can't grow in sand. Well, his word, he said, we're taller than his trailer. <laughs> and we know that the florist roses Rose people do it for a purpose because they want the really long stems. And the most vigorous rose you're going to get is in pure sand. Uh, we did that at our house too. We, well, we actually put it in our potting soil, had a whole bed of our potting soil. And uh, there were, we put in um, Floribunda roses, which are supposed to be three to four foot. Well, they all made it to six. He said, okay, that's a mistake. <laughs> that Our soil is too good for, to put these roses in the front yard because they're all too tall. So um, you don't want to make your soil too good for roses unless you, you know, backyard, no problem. They can be, you know, eight foot tall if you want them to be. But when they uh, grow that tall, are they full? Are they straight? Yeah, they look fine. They're they just, look long. yeah. Well, the problem we have is that a lot, roses, what they do a lot is they send out new canes from the dirt. So... This cane here was grown this year and it grew out of the dirt and came up about four or five feet. Well, if they're too vigorous, that first, you know, that cane grows eight foot and then the flowers at the very top. Of course, you can cut it and then they'll bloom on a shorter stem and then they'll bloom at a certain height. But uh, yeah, the more, I don't know, the more airy the soil, the, the t longer those stems get. So. So clay can make them shorter. Clay makes plants generally shorter, and sand makes them taller. So you can you can manipulate your rose bed if you want on how long you want the stems to be. So if you're making a rose garden, generally the general rule has always been three feet apart between the center of one plant and the center of the next. So you plant one rose here. One rose here, three feet apart is good. Uh, so most rose gardens, if you go to them, um, they'll have a double row. If you like roses, you make a double row and then you have walking paths on either side of that so you can do your maintenance on them. Uh, some people have a double row and then a real small walkway in the middle between two double rows if they want to fit more roses in there. So you, 
because you need, do need to do the pruning on them. The deadheading is the most important. Deadheading is when you take uh, the spent bloom, which is like this one here, and then just at least take it off that much. So Now, the further apart you put roses, the least, less likely are to spread bugs and diseases from one plant to the next. So if you have one rose in the middle of your lawn, you may never have a problem with it. It may not get any disease, uh, may not get, you know, uh, nowadays we get more and more bugs, but uh, may not get any diseases if it's out there by itself. And we notice that people who live on the beach know this, so I was at a rose garden once in Malibu and their roses were like 15 foot apart. They gave them lots of room and uh, very few problems. I mean, the other thing would be uh, walls can be a problem with the mildew. Mildew is a disease that uh, likes still air, humidity, and all that. Uh, the roses on the mid street medians never get it because the air moves so well on the street. The cars uh, move that air, and the mildew doesn't have a chance. Uh, what we found at our house was if we had a house wall, any rose within seven foot of it got mildew pretty badly if it was susceptible. Beyond seven foot out in the open, mildew problems were a lot less. So, so you can say 10 foot from a solid wall or just an area that, that has good airflow, you're not going to get mildew. It could be against the wall, but if there's good airflow there on the street, uh, you're not going to get much mildew. Mildew is our number one disease that we get because we're <coughs> near the coast. Uh, what makes Orange County livable is also what makes mildew on roses. That is um, 50, 60 degrees at night, high humidity, and about 80 degrees during the day. That's mildew weather. Uh, so. Mildew season typically is late April. Oops. To uh, through June. Yes. How about for climbers? Do you want them to climb a wall? Then they also. Well, they uh, climbers. Most of them grow stems at least seven foot long. Now, um, that spacing on them would be probably about every 10 feet, because they can easily do five foot in all directions. So, if you want them to touch, you don't, you know, they don't, they don't have to touch. Some people put climbers along, um, uh, what do you call it, split wood fences, and they look good that way too. So mildew is our biggest problem. The spacing really helps on that. Um, the other thing to know about roses is, is you can't put them in the same soil twice without uh, consequences. So like any crop we know of, or any plant we know of, if you take a rose out of an old rose bed and put a new one right in behind it, it just sits there and, and does nothing. Uh, even though the other rose in the bed may still be performing well, the one you replace has a lot of trouble. And that's because if you take a, a, an existing rose out, you leave behind a lot of severed roots. Even if it was healthy the moment you took it out, there's a, the ground around it's full of severed roots of itself. So it's dying roots of a rose. You put another rose right in there, and it's got um, it's just been all its energy staying healthy. But it can't grow at that same time. So one of my rose, uh, former rose experts we had here, Ben, who had a rose garden of 100 roses, and he replaced uh, at least 20 every year. He was just, you know, he didn't, didn't like to see the same roses year after year, so he replaced at least a, a fifth of his whole bed every year. He said one bag of our acid mix, which is the soil that we usually grow our roses in, um, in the hole with the new rose was enough virgin soil to make that new rose grow like it was in virgin soil. More the better, but he said one bag was enough. One bag is equivalent to about a seven to ten gallon container. So that's a lot of that's a pretty good amount of soil. 
for rows to grow and um, their roots will go through that this soil fine and when they hit the soil with the old rows roots they'll just stop. But this is enough to get them going. Now you can grow those in containers. Um, 15 gallon would be kind of the minimum if you want to grow a rose full size. You can grow them smaller, but uh, they'll, they'll be smaller than they want to be. Uh, some people use the half, uh, half barrels, half wine barrels, which are about double the volume of this. So, And they do pretty well. The, the main problem with black plastic, if it's not shade in the summer, is the heat. So when it gets 100 degrees, and, and that'll happen to container plants even if they're not black plastic, just because the air, you know, when this year when we got up to 114, 115 degrees, the soil in the pot was the same temperature. You couldn't hide it. In fact, it, if it was black plastic, it might have been 20 degrees hotter than that. It might have been 140 degrees in there. So... Uh, and that, when the roots are that hot, the rose plants look cooked. Now, so far it hasn't killed them, and they seem to recover well when the temperature cools off again. But compared to a rose in the ground, where the ground temperature rarely ever breaks 90, which is fine, Root, plant roots are fine with 90, they're not fine above 90, so the rose in containers can look sick all summer, the rose in the ground look fine. Unless you don't mulch the surface of the ground. So make sure the, mul the surface of your ground has got either plants over it or mulch on top to, to insulate the surface. Bare dirt can get quite hot. You see a lot of rose gardens where there's bare dirt and those roses look cooked too. The um, research that's been done says that bare soil in the summertime on a 90 degree day can hit 120 degrees one foot deep. If it's mulched, it'll stay in the 80s. Three inches of mulch will keep it in the 80s. So. Um, so the plants and roses look a lot better when the ground's mulched. And again, if you're replacing a rose, make sure you fix the soil. Now the rose growers who grow roses for us, uh, they own a lot of land. So they said they grow one crop of roses, which is a two year crop on their farmland once every five years. So that's two years for roses, three years for other crops, and then they plant roses again. So it takes three years to clean out the dirt between a two-year rose crop. Now, the longer the rose is in the ground, the longer it takes to clear out the crop. Like we know, uh, Napa Valley, they grow grapevines. When the grapevines get old, they pull them out, but they're not allowed to rotate crops. In Napa Valley, you're only allowed to grow grapes, so they have to leave the land fallow. In other words, let the weeds grow instead for 10 years before they put new grapes back in. And I would imagine if you had a 10-year-old rose bed, or 12 year old's road bed, it might take that long for the soil to get rid of all the dead rose roots after you pull those out. So just be aware of that when you're replanting roses. Yes? So it's just the rose roots. So if you had another plant you pulled up and then planted a rose roots, they don't care. Those roots won't bother, just right. the rose roots. Yeah, I came across this in the 1980s. I had been grown, I had a 50 uh, rose rose garden. We had been replacing roses without doing this. And after about five years, we noticed that the newer roses weren't doing anything. The roses that were original in the bed, they were, were doing fine. But the new ones he put in just wouldn't bloom more than once a year. Uh, got frustrated, pulled them all out, put in hibiscus. The hibiscus did fine. They don't care about dead rose roots around them. It's just the roses don't care, don't like it. So uh, that's what crop rotation is all about. You've got to get something in there that doesn't care about the last crop. Uh, being in there. Now my first rose bed I made, I did the soil totally wrong, but the roses still did well. So uh, they are very tolerant of bad uh, soil. So in those days, we thought the more compost you put in the ground, the better. So I made that rose, first rose bed, I had at least one third compost the roses they look fine but when I dug one out to replace it I noticed that all the roots below about four inches were black and slimy they had all rotted in that ground below four inches but the rose looked fine even though most of its root system was black and slimy it had enough healthy roots roots near the surface 
to keep that plant looking good and growing fine. But that's what compost does to your soil. Below four inches, there wasn't enough oxygen to support the roots, so it just died and and uh, rotted away. So my my last rose bed where I put the potting soil in the ground was, you know, you can get some really good roots in that, but apparently too vigorous. Um, so you have to be careful of that too. So anyway, um, when we get our roses in a few weeks, they'll be bare root. And generally come to us with few or no leaves on them. Usually the growers cut the stems to about a foot long and we just get the stems. Um, we usually get five to ten stems on a rose plant, and then the roots about six or six inches to maybe a twelve inches of root along with it. Now, in the old days, before nineteen, say nineteen ninety-five or so, uh, the rose growers would grow the roses for three years in the ground. Now they only do it for two. So uh, in the old days, back in the 80s, when we get a bare root rose in, there are just absolutely gorgeous plants. So we'd get, uh, usually I would say five to eight stems, all the size of this, uh, grafted onto the rootstock. And the rootstock and the roots would look like this. I mean, they were just absolutely perfect plants. Nowadays, you get a plant like that, it's like, Maybe one out of ten looks this good, but in the old days, this was natural for us to get something that was, you know, stems were this long, roots were this long, nice, heavy, two-pound plant. Uh, nowadays, they usually have two or three stems that look decent, um, and the roots are a lot, because they're just younger plants, they're a year younger. Um, but the rose growers are really trying to control costs, so the, some are even doing younger than that but uh, anyway when we talk about grade one roses and I don't know if anyone's selling too many bare roots anymore but grade number one was when you had a plant with at least three stems that were not this big but at least as thick as a pencil and in the old days yeah there was nothing even close to that everything was really nice but nowadays yeah everything's coming in real skinny, pencil-like, uh, grade one, you have three of them, and it can be three that look like this. They don't even have to start from the bottom anymore. That's still a grade one rose. So anyway, we get them in. Um, we to take them home for you to keep them from drying out because they can't dry out. They come to us and these huge boxes filled with 100 roses. They weigh about 300 pounds or so. Uh, we put them into our displays, but for our customers, we'll put them into a, a sealed, real thick plastic bag with wet paper around them. They can sit in there for a few weeks, no problem. Uh, you can put, take them home, put them in a bucket of water, which is a little safer, and store them that way for a while too. If the water, if you change the water and keep the water from getting too hot, they can even bloom in there. You don't have to plant them right away. So they have a fairly good life since they're not, you know, they don't have any leaves on them yet. They'll start, although they will start growing pretty fast, especially if you keep them in your house. If you keep them outside in a shed somewhere where it's cooler, like this year we're actually getting winter temperatures, then they'll sit quiet. The rose growers actually, they're, they're harvesting now. They put them in these huge warehouses that are air conditioned. Although in the Central Valley, you don't really need much air conditioning because it's cold there right now. But they said they keep them right around 48 degrees and they will stay dormant in that state till June. So the same growers who sent them to us in December are going to hold them in those, in those warehouses and send them to Maine around May. It's when they uh, get all the roses sent across the country because Maine doesn't warm up until May. So, in fact, uh, I ordered a rose once from, uh, was it uh, a nursery on the East Coast, a bare root rose, and I got it in May, and I talked to my grower here, and he says, oh, we sold it to them, and they sold it back to you. 
We harvested in December, sold to them in May, and they sold back to you. In <laughs> so, mm -hmm. no, no, I'd plant it. Yeah, you can. If you don't get around to it, you can store it. But the sooner you get in the ground, the better. So the way we plant these. out of paper okay so when you put them in the ground so the problem we've had for the last five years was the winter was really dry and windy now this year looks like it's gonna be moisture so you don't have to may not have to do this but what we do is the rose originally was in the ground with the stems above the dirt and of course the roots below it Um, <laughs> we got a kick out of this one last year. I hope you're not here, but uh, the person who did this wasn't here. But uh, she had her gardener plant her bare roses, and after a month, she says they're not growing. Uh, so I said, "Well, send me a picture of your roses." And her gardener planted them all upside down. Oh, no. <laughs> so the roots were in the air and the stems were in the ground. <laughs> We couldn't believe that one. That, that's one of the most unusual. <laughs> so I just emailed it to my uh, my suppliers. They got a good kick out of that one. But uh, anyway, so you want the stems above, and the stems have the thorns. It's easy to see, uh, and the roots below it. Now, some of the things. Enough. It's a new rose bed. Uh, there's very little issues. You just do that. Now, generally. When we plant roses in our pots, we cut the stems down to maybe four to six inches. And that way, there's no chance of them drying out in the wind, especially because the lip on the pot kind of keeps them from drying out too. But in the ground, if it's a windy spot and you want a taller stem on there, you can do like an eight inch stem or even taller. But then what you do after you plant it and water it in is you take the dirt from out here and mount it up like this. It takes two weeks for the roots to get an operation below the surface. So if you keep these stems covered with dirt for a couple of weeks, keeps them from drying out because they can shrivel up. If, if, if we have a Santa Ana condition, they'll just shrivel on you and won't sprout. Sometimes, it's, you know, a few months later, they start sprouting from down in here, and that's all you get. But our old, you know, for most years, what we tell people to do is, you know, get them planted at the right level, water them in once, and then take the mud around them and pile it up onto the stems. The most important thing to note is do not use compost or planter mix to cover the stems. Uh, compost or planter mixes in general are compost, and in that is decomposing plant material. You put decomposing plant material up around new leaves, it decomposes them. They all just get eaten up by the bacteria that's doing the composting, so that doesn't work at all. We've had people do that; it just, you know, it just kills the plant. They're rotting in that pile of, of dead stuff, so do not use compost. Do this. Peat moss can work, green moss can work, but dirt is just fine. Dirt is better. Now, if you have an old rose bed, do be aware that there are diseases from the old roses present in here. So what we tell people to do, if you do any pruning on, your, on this plant, prune the roots, make fresh cuts on it to make it the length you want, and the roots, if they're too long, you cut them shorter, make them the length you want. Le put them back in the bag for at least a day after your pruning, because if you get a freshly cut root in contact with an old rose bed, it can get a, a disease called uh, bacterial canker. And bacterial canker is real common in, in rose beds. Any fresh wound on this plant you put in contact with that, they can get what looks like a uh, tumor on that part of that plant. It'll develop big swellings on the roots, on the trunk, the crown of the plant. If it's got some wounds on it, they can get these big old tumors. They're not cancer they're kind of like benign tumors but they can they're real unsightly if you get them on there 
And I used to get that a lot because I would put my rows in the same rose bed over and over and over. And we found out, oh, if you leave, cut it, we do our pruning on there, put it back in the plastic bag, plant the next day, that wound is pretty good healed, and then it won't catch those diseases. If it's a new rose bed, no problems. No rose diseases yet. <clears throat> so once the sprouts start to merge at the tips of these branches, then you can take the dirt off or you can leave it. Um, you know, if you're in Minnesota, you plant your roses this deep. And they do that because it's so cold there, these just freeze. So they plant them underground so they don't freeze. So back in the 80s, I plant all my roses this deep to see what happened. Nothing happens. They, they're fine. They just root out of here. So you can plant them too deep, and they're just fine. No issues. Unless your soil doesn't breed down here. You lose all these roots, but they regrow new roots at the top, and they're still fine. So. Now the tree roses, we've had a lot of trouble with three of, uh, four of the last five years. Uh, stand out there in the sand and winds, they just shrivel up. We've had people bring them back, shriveled up. So what we did with them is we would just lay them on the ground, the wet ground, and cover them with wet blankets, and they would rehydrate and start growing again. Um, so this year we decided not to sell any bare root, just put them in containers, either put them in our greenhouse or put them in our shader where the wind won't get them, they'll sprout out, and then we'll sell them. Is uh, last year and three, three years ago, but we had so many tree rows being returned, all shriveled up, that uh, I decided, oh, let's not play that game anymore. It's it's it is chancy with something that tall. So now in Minnesota, what they would do with tree roses is they would you, know, you have a tree rose standing up here in the winter time. They would dig a whole big excavate half the root system, and then lean the whole tree rose, pull it down to the ground and bury it for the winter, then unbury it in the spring and put it back up. So that's what they would do. So in parts of the country, growing roses is a chore. In fact, uh, a lot of people in the, uh, in the middle of the country, um, they would cover it with dead leaves all winter, just pile all their dead leaves from the trees over them, and then cover them with snow, and that kind of insulates and keeps them from freezing. If you're in Alaska, you got permafrost, you can't do that even. So we're kind of the uh, best place to grow roses right here. In fact, it's interesting, back in the late 80s, we were leasing some land in Irvine, right by, I think it was Myford Road, Anyway, we're leasing some land. We noticed there were roses growing on it, and there were greenhouses on it. We, we found out it was the uh, breeding grounds from Jackson Perkins in the 1960s and 70s. They bred the roses in Orange County, <coughs> in Irvine. And they moved up. After that, they moved off the property, but uh, we were leasing that, so kind of fun to know that. Um, questions on starting them. Now the things that happen to rose during the year, uh, generally around March, all the new growth on your roses get aphids. Now let me get a new sheet. Grab a new easel, I'll be right back.
Aphids are known as plant lice. They're little, usually little green or amber colored bugs. You get a colony of them at the end of each branch, hundreds of them within. You know, aphids are, the adult aphid flies, lands or gives live birth to young female aphids that are already pregnant. In fact, they said the aphids, the moment they're born, they have an embryo in them that has an embryo in it that has an embryo in it. So they reproduce like in every three days they got a new generation because they're born pregnant and their and their babies are born pregnant too, are their babies. So it's crazy. They can, you know, one aphid landing on here and in a couple of weeks you can have a hundred on there. Um, now at my own house we learned don't treat those. Uh, there are plenty of good bugs that'll come along and clean them up and then keep them perfect clean the rest of the year if you can stand it. Some years it takes a couple months for them to clean it up. If it's too, especially if it's real cool that spring, if it's warm, they find them right away. So the, the first, the, the main predators on aphids, the main good guys, the first ones are actually uh, fly larvae, which look terrible on your plant. <laughs> but there's a critter called the surfid fly which is also known as a hoverfly. So you see this fly that's hovering around that looks, it's color, same colors as a bee, but you can tell it's not a bee because it's too small and it doesn't have the right wings. But it does this, it hovers, comes down, comes back, right back up. It's laying eggs. It's, it's hunting for those aphids and lays eggs. But its larva is a green maggot. I mean, it looks horrible on your plant. It's green maggot slopping around, but that green maggot can eat like 30 aphids a day. So uh, anyway, that's one of the first ones out. There's actually a smaller maggot we get to, a little golden maggot from a, um, a gnat sized fly that flies around and does the same thing. So those are usually the first predators out. Uh, ladybugs come later, lacewings come later, but they'll keep your aphids cleared off the rest of the year. So we hate to spray them for aphids because the good guys will come in and do a good job. Um, Generally around April, the mildew starts, and also at the same time we get flower thrips. Now this one we usually treat. Fortunately, we, can, we have a good uh, organic control nowadays. That's your Captain Jack's. Dead bug brew. 20 years ago, we didn't have this product. Boy, it, we had to treat it with chemicals, but now that we have an organic one, it's much nicer. Um, so what, hap what the flower thrips would do is, right when the flower bud would open its sepals and you'd see the color in there, the little thrips. Now thrips are critters that are shaped like a sliver. I mean, they're, generally you cannot see much features on them, but you. Well, if you walk outside in the springtime with a yellow shirt on, there are bugs, these bugs will look, find you because they like yellow and they'll start pinching your skin. You'll go, what was that? And you can't see it because it's so small, but it, it's, it's trying out to see if you're a plant because they're attracted to chartreuse yellow. So uh, don't wear yellow shirts in your garden, but, uh, or even light green ones sometimes do it. But these small critters land, the, the adults fly, they land on the new flower buds, this opening up. They like the lighter colors better. Red roses, you rarely see the damage, but the white, yellow, light pink, they'll lay like 50 eggs in that bud that, oh, that hatch real fast. The young thrips will go in there and suck on the petals, and all the outer petals on that flower will be brown on the edge. Now, if you pick off the outer petals, your flower looks fine. But uh, if you don't pick them off, it looks terrible. So those bugs come in usually uh, mid-spring, get in each flower. Uh, now, Captain Jack's, the problem we have with this product is it doesn't stick to the buds too well because the buds are so waxy. You put about two or three drops of ivory liquid in here or some kind of dish soap. It makes it stick a lot better. And then spray the bud. And if you spray the buds twice a week, just go out there like Sunday and Wednesday, see what buds are just starting to open, spritz the tips of them only. That's the only place you have to spray them. 
uh, you'll stop them after about two weeks of that. You'll stop all the thrips for the, it seems like the rest of the year of, for the flower thrips. So watch your white roses. Those are the ones that usually get it first. We used to have this aerosol product called Orthonex. The bad thing about aerosols is when they come out of the nozzle, they're ice cold. So people would go and shh, and the tips of their buds would just turn black because they froze them. So uh, be careful with those aerosols. The, the trigger sprayers like this are fine. So everybody's gone that and not that they've gotten rid of the aerosols. Now there is a product out there called Orthonex and I think it's still there. Uh, don't use that on your roses ever. It's meant for roses. It controls thrips real well, controls aphids real well, but it kills off so many of the good bugs that you get, you have to fight the rest of your on spider mites. Uh, it, it's real strange. Back in the 80s, we would spray our roses for aphids with orthonex, and we'd be fighting spider mites all summer long. And then one year we decided, let's not treat with orthonex, and suddenly we never had spider mites anymore. So that one product causes nothing but heartache because spider mites are really nasty, but because we don't use them anymore, no one sees them anymore. So uh, remember, that don't use orthonex if you see it. And then you won't have to deal with spider mites. Uh, flower thrips. Um, so we talked about mildew. Now mildew, if you get it, and you often will, if we get uh, weather like we had this year, uh, day after day of overcast mornings and things, the organic, best organic method is to get out there with the neem oil. Now if you spray neem oil on mildew within three or four days of when you first notice it, and mildew looks like white haze on the new growth, um, you'll stop it. Neem oil is quite good at that. If the, if the mildew's on there for two or three weeks, you just have to cut the end of the stem off, let it regrow. So that's what the white leaves. Right. Makes the new leaves roll. I mean, we on one rose at our house, it was a uh, touch of class, which is real prone to mildew. Uh, we decide, well, let's see what happens if we don't treat it. So all the ends of the branches turn white, the buds turn white, and it sat there and didn't do anything for four months. The same buds, they didn't die, they didn't open, they just sat there. So we wasted about a third of the year just with mildew on the ends. So we finally just cut it all off and it regrew and bloomed. Within a month after that, it started blooming again. So mildew just shuts the plant down. It's a surface disease. It doesn't get inside the rose. It's just all over the outside of it. So if you cut it off, you've gotten rid of it. So again, mildew, uh, neem oil is the number one. Um, organic treatment for it. And how do you spray that? Just on the whole plant? Just on the new growth is fine. Just where the white is? Right. It doesn't have any residual oil. For some reason, any kind of oil, even the, uh, I didn't bring the other one, mineral oil. We have a cell mineral oil too, which is cheaper and smells better than neem oil. Neem oil is a, uh, a seed oil from a tree called the neem tree from India. Uh, but it is, I don't know, but they're both pretty non-toxic unless you drink too much of it. But uh, it, it, for some reason, just lifts the mildew off the plant, and then the oil evaporates and it's gone. It also kills bugs. Uh, it kills slow-moving bugs. So if you wanted to do something on the aphids, if you spray the oil on there, you'll kill about 90% of them. Oil never seems to kill 100%, and if you leave one or two aphids there, they multiply so fast, it's like you never did anything. But if you sprayed it constantly, you'll control your aphids too. But the other bugs do that better. Um, it doesn't kill anything fast moving. So grasshopper, caterpillars, no, it can't hurt them. Uh, mainly it's uh, aphids, white fly scale. But on roses, about the only one we get is the aphids. Oh, it does spider mites well. So if you happen to get spider mites really badly, the oils do a real good job on spider mites. Um, so mildew. Now if we have a lot of rain this spring, we haven't had that much rain in the last 
even two years ago, we didn't have that much rain in the spring. So if it rains past April, we tend to get two other diseases, rust and black spot. And if we have a lot of rain this winter, there's another one called downy. Now, in the East Coast, they call it downy mildew. Here, we don't see the mildew part of downy, so we just call it downy. Um, now, in the heyday of roses in the 80s, all we had were mildew and rust. Black spot came into California in the 90s, and so did downy, and these two have caused a lot of aches and pains, but only when we have a lot of rain. You get rain throughout the spring, we get both these real bad. So rust on the bottom of the leaf actually looks like rust. It's kind of these orange spots that form on the bottom of the leaf. The leaf turns yellow and falls off. Black spot it's a fuzzy edged black spot, big spot on the bottom of the leaf, and then the leaf turns yellow and falls off. Uh, downy sometimes gives you a real vague purplish spot on the leaf, but generally what happens, the leaf just turns yellow and drops. And on miniature roses, downy is really bad. So if you have a miniature rose, because they're so compact and the leaves don't dry out, um, all the leaves turn yellow and fall off. And then it grows back when it dries up. That's downy. Downy's doing that on your rose. It makes all the leaves turn yellow and fall off. The problem with black spot downy is the disease can also get into the stem. So generally on roses, the stems are either reddish or greenish, or when they get older, they're grayish. Well, if you see a green stem with uh, purplish blotches or red blotches on it, that's lesions from either one of these two diseases. And generally, it's better to cut it off below that and let it come from a part of the plant that's not affected. They said in New York, because they get rain in the summer, the roses, you know, sometimes the rose plants are like this tall. They've been cutting off all these lesions, and they've got nothing left. So black spot is a really nasty disease, and so is downy. Now downy, uh, we don't worry about past around April because downy does not like anything above 80 degrees. Downy likes cool, wet weather. So back in the early, mid-90s, we had those El Ninos. That's when downy was just messing up all the nerves. You know, it didn't, homeowners didn't even notice, but the nurseries were growing roses, and we started them in winter, and then we're supposed to sell them by March blooming. Well, Downey was just messing everybody up. They, and we didn't know what, the, what that disease was back then. It apparently came in from Australia or something like that. So everybody was sterilizing their tools to see if they can stop it. Uh, most homeowners, again, just don't worry about this because by the time we get around to our garden, it's already warm and the Downey is gone. But if you see your rose in the middle of winter turning yellow, it's usually Downey doing that. Um, now, one person in Maine got this bright idea, and it actually did work for them. They just connected their hose to the hot water laundry faucet and sprayed hot water over the roses at 120 degrees water. They sprayed over the roses. They said it cured them. They kind of smelled like they were cooking, but it cured the disease down. It stopped it right there. I mean, you know, for us, 180-degree day, that's it. Downy is done for the year. Uh, there are some... Uh, this, uh, sprays that we carry. I think I have one. Well, let me bring it up here. So one product we have is very good against downy and very non-toxic. It's called Garden Foss. It's an interesting product. The University of California sent letters to all the nurseries uh, back in around 2000 about this product because they were real intrigued with it. Uh, all it does for the plant is it gets more phosphorus into their system. 
So phosphorus is one of the main fertilizers in a plant, and they're upping the phosphorus content of the plant's sap, and phosphorus helps them fight off disease. So it's kind of boosting their immune system. But they said uh, certain root rots, they said the root rot, main root rot on avocados, this thing can tr bring a tree back from dead just about, they said. If you apply this to an avocado tree that's rotting away, it'll save it. And they were just amazed at how well it worked. Um, mono and dye, potassium salts, which is also a fertilizer of phosphorus acid. Uh, now, we drink phosphoric acid in Diet Coke. I wonder if that'll work. But anyway, <laughs> um, this one has done a good job on downy. What's it called? Uh, Garden Foss. Used to be called Agrifos, but now they label it for homeowner use. Uh, and the nice thing about it too is that this will stop downy on. So downy is a disease that's coming to the U.S. from all around the world that affects a lot of different plants. It'll stop the downy on impatiens. So impatiens used to be the most popular bedding plant in the U.S. until downy hit it, and then every time it rains, it defoliates. Basil defoliates when it rains. Uh, onions can do the same thing, and this will stop down in any of those plants. So it has become real valuable. Plus, there's no waiting time because it's a fertilizer. In many states in the United States, they don't even label this as a pesticide. They just say it's a fertilizer. In California, they label it as pesticide, but there's no waiting time. You can spray this on your basil and eat it because it's not considered a poison to people. So it's real nice that way. It's one of the uh, interesting products we have. Now this is more of a conventional mycoblutinol uh, fungicide that'll cure almost any rose disease we have. Um, if you want to go chemical, this one can do it. Now, serious rose growers, when there was a time when roses were real popular, we actually had like 15,000 roses in our nursery at one time. No, I don't think it was 15,000, 1,500. Still a lot of roses in our nursery, lots to spray. So we would use a product called uh, Compass. That was so potent. Uh, one teaspoon would treat every rose in our nursery. That's how strong that product was. But people have big rose gardens, Compass. The other ones out there, Banner Max. So if you're a real serious rose grower, and there are some serious guys around. I mean, we had customers who had more rose than we did, 500 rose rose garden up in uh, Laguna Hills area. Um, I don't know that we had three customers who were all physicians at, at uh, Saddleback College or at Mission Hospital, and they had these huge rose gardens, and they brought rose to work and to their patients. and they would ask us to buy these products for them because they had such big rose gardens. But Compass, Banner Max, uh, nowadays Heritage. Uh, the problem with disease is, is that they keep evolving. So, you know, Comp Banner Max was the best thing we had in the 80s, Compass in the 90s, now it's Heritage. Uh, the disease has become immune to different products as you know, you, when you spray something on a disease, you wipe out 99.9% .9 of its population, but the 1%, 1.1% that's alive is immune to that disease, uh, to that product, so you have to keep on making new ones. So anyway, um, if you don't want any of the diseases, you would use Heritage right now. And Heritage costs a lot, so most homeowners wouldn't buy it. It's like 80 bucks for four ounces but that four ounces will treat maybe 5,000 roses one time. So it goes a long way. But, you know, the other way you do this is, like in my house, what we ended up doing was uh, don't prune your roses and clean them up until April each year. So traditionally in California was December, January, you would cut your roses back, pull off all the leaves, and let them regrow. Well, the problem is, is it's still raining until April, usually. So there was an article in the LA Times in the 1980s from someone who moved here from back east. says, why do you guys cut back your roses in the winter? Why don't you do it like the rest of the country and do it in spring? And so I said, that makes some sense. So I would 
So in April of every year, the new growth would be all ready to shoot out from the base of the rows and all the leaves on the plant were diseased. So I just cut it back at that time, leave the new growth alone and uh, that's it. You cut off all the rust, all the black spot, all the mildew, all, well mildew doesn't happen in the winter time, rust black spot and downy, any problem like that, you just cut it all off and your rose is clean and by the time the new growth starts, the rain is over, no more problems for the rest of the year. You get rid of all the bad diseases when you cut them in April. But if you cut them in December or January and it rains until April, then you've got to go through it again in May and clean up all the rust and the black spot. So if you don't spray for it, if you spray for it, you won't get it. But if you don't want to do your spraying, just cut it later in the year and you don't have to, then you clean them up in one shot at that time. So from that, from the 80s on, or maybe 1990, I started doing it in April instead. And that way, the roses bloom all winter. And when you cut them back in April, it only takes them about six weeks to bloom after, at that point. Whereas if you cut them in December, they don't bloom until March. So you don't miss your roses for three months. So roses, uh, in general, um, if, you, if you cut off a rose, that same stem re-blooms in an average of six weeks. But it's over 10 weeks if you do it in winter, and it's four weeks if you do it in summer. So they're faster when the weather's warmer. Well, heritage, you won't see it. Yeah, Compass, you probably won't see it. If you use this product, you won't see it. Uh, this one says it controls rust, but it doesn't. doesn't. So, is that garden? No, this only does downy. Oh, okay. So, Fungimax. Uh, the Bayer products have, uh, let's see what they're using. Uh, Tebuconazole is in here. So, uh, in my house this worked, well, yeah. this worked 10 years ago at my house. I, I don't know if it works anymore. You still have to, you have to keep up with the new products to control these. So, with that uh, Max, you just spray it? Mm-hmm. And underneath? Or something yeah, there? the whole thing. Okay. And generally, you have to add a wetting agent to that, too. So, again, uh, Ivy Liquid Dawn, we're, we're trying... You know, for some reason, our suppliers this last year quit carrying all the spray adjuvants that we like so that, you know, you can add them to this stuff to make it stick on better. And they've only got one left, and we don't like it. It causes damage on the leaves. So we're telling people, okay, uh, maybe four drops of ivory liquid and a gallon of water is good enough. But if you, if you don't add a wetting agent when you spray a leaf, especially a waxy leaf like a rose, the water just beads up, doesn't spread out. If you add the right amount of soap, it'll spread out. If you add too much soap, it runs off. It won't stay at all, it just runs off. So you have to kind of find out, because every time you buy ivory or dawn or joy, it's a different concentration from, you know, if they have a different bottle, <laughs> you know, they, they sell all different price points, so they're different concentrations. You have to find out what, how much to use. Um, and I would say, I don't know, uh, if it's a real strong product, I think it's about 10 drops per gallon is about right, but I don't know. It, every soap is different, so you'll have to see. So these are the diseases. Again, you can get by without using any chemicals on this if you time your pruning right. Uh, mildew is the main one that <coughs> it goes on beyond April. So, uh, and that, that you can control with the, the organic product. Now, the new bug in town is the one that's driving us nuts. This came into Orange County about four years ago, the chili thrips. Fortunately, we're cool here and they don't like it cool, they like it hot. In Florida, where the chili thrips entered the U.S., they're active from about April or May until October, November. Here, we don't see them, we didn't see them this year till August through October. That's 
So it was warm in those months. I know it seems they need a little bit of heat to get them going, and then once they get going, they're real devastating. But what? So the chili thrips uh, are unlike the flower thrips. Don't just like the flower petals. They like any new growth on your rose. So what they've been doing is they've come over to a rose plant, and not all over Orange County yet. They seem to be worst in central Orange County and northern Orange County, less than the south southern parts of Orange County. But the way a thrip feeds on a plant, it's so, so small it goes to the softest tissue it can and makes a slice in it. And whatever oozes out, they lap it up, and that's how they feed. Well. They do all the slicing, dicing on the new growth, and your new growth just gets so badly scarred, it turns, you know, if, it's, if they're real heavy infestation, it looks like someone just torched it, it turns black, shrivels up, and it dies. Or if it's a lighter infestation, it looks like somebody just, like it's a toasted marshmallow, they just hit it with a flame for a second, so all the buds get brown, gray-brown on the outside. They, it's hard from the open because they're so badly scarred. Um, I mean, it's called chili thrip because it goes through the chili plants and the tomato plants really bad. It just, all the leaves just fall off. Um, but it attacks almost anything that's growing quickly at that time. I mean, they've already counted over 300, 400 plants that this bug will attack the new growth of. So we've seen it do new banana leaves, new ginger leaves, new grape leaves, new fig leaves. I mean, anything that's growing quickly, this bug will just go after it. So it's a nasty critter. Fortunately, Captain Jax does a good job on it. Otherwise, we'd be in real bad trouble. So the Captain Jax dead bug brew can do the chili thrips, too. Um, what they're recommending for long-term use is alternate products. So University of Texas and University of Florida in uh, alternate Captain, Captain Jack's the proper name for it is Spinosad. It's an organic, well, it's a product that's made by a bacteria that lives in the distilleries in the Caribbean. So if you drink rum, you've already drank Spinosad or Captain Jack's. That's why they call it, and they're going after the Pirates of the Caribbean theme, I guess, Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. But they found it in a, a distillery in, in the uh, Caribbean islands. But it kills any chewing bug, kills strips, kills fleas. So it's interesting, my dog's flea tablet that she eats is Spinosad. Eat Spinosad, kills all the bugs in your body and on the outside of your body, too. <laughs> anyway, so it's a pretty safe product around people. Uh, but they say to alternate it with uh, imidacloprid so there's there's less chance of becoming immune now imidacloprid is also known as merit it got a real bad name for about 10 years because the um, one faction was saying well this is causing all the bees to die no one talks about it more because they've said it's not now They've proven now that it's not, but still, it's got that uh, negativity. I mean, you know, uh, what is it? Home Depot and Lowe's quit selling plants to retreat with this. Now, the reason why the industry likes this product because it's almost non-toxic to mammals. Very bad against bees, but almost non-toxic to mammals. So I looked at my cat's flea medicine. It's this. Put it all over your cat, kills the fleas, doesn't hurt the cat. So it's very non toxic to mammals, but goes after, and unfortunately, it kills bees, but it doesn't. They said it's not killing the colony because the bees that die don't make it back to the colony. Um, and they're not having that problem in Australia. You know, Australia uses this product all over the place. They said the bees in Australia just aren't dying. So it's not this. Uh, and in Switzerland, they're not allowed to use pesticides at all, and their bees are still dying. So they know it's not this either. They, it's, it's been pointed now to um, varroa mites carrying a, 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 back, a, a, a virus. So the varroa mites are a bee parasite 
uh, that are carrying a virus that's killing the bees. They said this might have a little bit of problems with the beehives, but they said they just cannot find enough in a beehive to, to blame it on this. As they said that the, the levels they're finding in the beehives is too low. They said it just can't be this product. So the, we're using this now, but be aware, it will kill a bee if it sucks on certain flowers. They're not, they're not finding all flowers to get this in them. Uh, there's one tree that's real bad. You spray this on a linden tree, all the flowers become toxic to bees. And you'll have hundreds of dead bees below the tree dying when they suck on the flower. Now, rose flowers we often remove before they're fully open, so it's not the worst thing in the world. And we don't know if this gets into the nectar of, of a rose flower or not, but uh, the, we do know it gets into the nectar of citrus flowers. So don't use this on citrus if you want to protect your bees. So that, the active ingredient in that is that. And then the spinoside is uh, for the captain. The captain this. Also. So they're saying if you alternate this and this, that's the best thing you do. If you want to be organic, alternate this and this. This, so the, the claim is spinosad and imiclopril will kill about 95% of the strips that are in contact with it. Oil may only do about half, but it's doing something. So people want to be organic. This one week, the oil the next week, just go back and forth between those two, and that'll help control the thrips uh, decently. And, you'll have, and you just have to spray the new growth. They only like the new growth, August through October. And you, you may be in a spot where you don't see these. Hopefully you are. South County so far is fairly clean. We're not sure why it's not traveling down there because it's sort of spread through North County and Central Orange County really quick. And this year was the worst in the last three years. But they just shut down the rose. It didn't kill the plant. It just shuts down all the new growth for a while. Trim it down to the main stem, or do you just trim it down to the bottom of this one? Uh, if like now until April, yeah. well, aggressive you get with here. Well, on roses, yeah, the new stems tend to bloom better than the old ones, but not all roses are the same. So it's you kind of do what your rose plant tells you to do, because they say with English roses you never trim off the old stems. You always leave, the older the stems get, the better the flowers look. Now we figure, we found, kind of found out why this happens. So the new roses, I mean the roses we grow, especially ones like say, let me get a picture of paradise out. So they're not even growing that one anymore. Well, let's get double light. So double light, which is the most popular rose being sold. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Okay, so normal look, nice red and white mix. Um, anyway, it looks like this. Well, we went over to uh, Huntington Gardens because Huntington Gardens says we don't like to cut our roses short. We like to leave them tall in the winter. So I went there one spring. This was about 20 years ago, and their stems on the roses were all woody, corky, and this thick. And they claimed they have a lot more flowers on them. So I looked at their double light. Their double light didn't look anything like this. It had petals more like this. And it had the same red and white colors, but didn't look anything like the picture we're used to. They look like English roses. So the, the more thicker the stems get, the more petals they get, but they lose that spiral. And they get all confused, which is the English rose look. <laughs> so the English rose those look better. They look more like English roses if you don't cut the stems. You have old stems on them. The roses we like to grow don't look anything like the roses we like if you let them get old. They get too many flower petals on, then they look totally different. So if you want that nice spiral, single spiral in the middle, you gotta make sure you have 
younger stems on your plant. So that's the big difference is that, yeah, you cut it to make the style of rose you want. So if you want that nice spiral, you don't let your rose stems get old. You cut off the old ones all the way to the ground and keep promoting the newer stems on your rose plant. So the, so like we, we noticed that in our paradise, if we let an old stem develop on the rose, those rows did not look like paradise anymore. We had had to save just the new stems that came out the last year. And even those, we like to cut those down almost to the dirt by summer to encourage new stems to come out because those new stems made the rows that look like the pictures. The older stems, they start looking different. And, and that's because they get more too much energy, I guess too much strength in those old stems, so they get too many petals and they don't look the same anymore. So there's no real rules to follow here, it's just you kind of train the rows the way you want it to look. Now they did a study in England that kind of blew all the old studies, all the old methods out of the, out of, the, out of, the uh, out of existence essentially. So, so we used to have these books written about printing roses properly. You know, you prune down to your first five leaflet leaf. Don't, you know, don't leave the smaller, you know, this is, on this particular stem, the first leaflet has got three, the second leaflet's got three, third leaflet's got three, the fourth leaflet on the stem has five. So if you just cut off the flowers down to the third leaflet leaf, this, the new growth bud at the bottom of this leaf will make a flower with maybe half the normal, normal petals on it. It's not strong enough whereas the stems that come out of the five leaf leaf are stronger and they make a better looking flower. So they would say first five leaf leaf, leaf on the stem is where you cut it down to. Uh, and then they would say, well, in the wintertime you leave you know, three to five your best canes if you have a hybrid tea. You leave five to eight if you have a floribunda. And they made all these rules up that you know, the, the best rosarians would follow these rules. And they'd said, yeah, this is how you get your best rose. And you want to have the open vase shape on your stems. You, want, you didn't want your stems to cross the middle and do all this stuff. So then in the 1990s they did a study in England because we're having, you know, that when roses started becoming less popular and they didn't have as many rosarians around, they started using machines to cut the roses. So they did a study to see how many, how the, how the machine pruning differed from the rosarian pruning. So they had this machine that just went over, they had 50 roses of one type in this bed, 50 roses in this other type. Best rosarians in England pruning this side, machine just hacking the tops off of this one once a month. And they counted how many quality roses they would, they each side would make. After five years, they had no difference. So they went another five, cons you know, convinced that the machines would eventually mess up the roses. And after 10 years, no difference. So they kind of threw all the books out, and now, now they have rules for how to uh, prune a rose bush with a chainsaw. <laughs> so apparently, as long as you get rid of the dead flowers so they don't sit there and make a seed pod, it doesn't matter how you prune a rose. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You'll get the same results. As long as you take off the dead flower, um, Apparently, it doesn't make any difference. Of course, they're using an older type of rose. Again, if you want, now I will tell you that I've been to quite a few rose gardens. I like the way Rose Hills looks. And I don't like the way Huntington Gardens looked when they had that one rose in there. He retired, so they have now Tom Carruth from, who retired from Weeks Roses there pruning rose. He probably is going to do a better job the way he wants to do it, the way he he bred a lot of the famous roses, so uh, he'll do a better job than the other guy who didn't like, I don't think he liked to work very much, so he didn't like to prune his roses, but uh, so anyway, uh, Rose Hills, if you go to Rose Hills in the wintertime, uh, the roses plants are about this big. They really cut them back hard versus Huntington Gardens, which leaves all the roses four feet. The roses at Rose Hills, the flowers look better in the summer to me than they do at Huntington Gardens, or did. Again, Huntington Gardens got under new uh, guidance now, so it should be fine. 
but uh, cut your roses, you know, get rid of a lot of last year's growth, force them to make new stems. The rose plants look really sharp. So Rose Hills um, uh, is interesting because they had a guy working there who was a chemist. So there is one fertilizer he created called uh, Magnum. You know, you know a guy did this when he calls it Magnum Rose Food. <laughs> so uh, well, yeah, Dr. Tommy Cairns, who was a chemist, uh, loved roses, uh, developed this for Rose Hills water and and soil. So he said, this is the fertilizers the roses needed for Rose Hills when you consider their soil conditions and their water. So you can, and that's just 20 miles away, so you figure, okay, this is going to work really well in Orange County too. So among the chemical fertilizers, this is probably the best you can do for roses. The problem with chemicals, of course, you've got to fertilize them every couple of weeks year-round, um, and it's not as beneficial to the soil organisms as an organic is. But for short-term purposes or in pots, uh, hard to beat this one just because the, the guy did a really good job with it. I mean, fortunately, roses aren't that picky, so almost anything will work on them, but if you want for long-term Rose care uh, organics tend to be better. Now plants are made out of 17. We th I actually think it's more like 18 minerals. The book says 17. But we think uh, their silicon is also in there. I mean, the soil in the ground is all silica. And when they started growing plants in soilless soils, they found out, hey, if you spray silicon on them, they look better. It's like... Grow them in dirt, stupid. Because <laughs> you, know? uh, you know they grow them in compost or in peat, straight peat. Yeah, the silicon's not there anymore, and the plants start suddenly getting kind of ugly. Well, and then they spray silicon. Well, yeah, plants are supposed to grow in silicon dioxide. That's what soil is. So yes. So when do you fertilize? Oh, yeah. So they did a study in Houston, Texas. Now Houston, Texas, is very similar temperature-wise to Sacramento. Hot in the summer, you know, the average 95 degrees in the summer, or even a little hotter than that, and about 40 degrees in the winter. So it's hot and cold there. Uh, so it's hotter and colder than here. But they found out that if, you know, traditionally in there, they would stop fertilizing in October to put the plants, quote, put them to sleep, and then start up again around March. Well, they found out if they fertilized them all the way through winter, those plants look better, the ones they just kept fertilizing. So. If it works in, in Houston, Texas, it'll work here too. Just feed them all the time. And how often? Like once a month? Depends on what you're using. So in my own house, when I would cut my roses back in the spring, <laughs> so what I would do is cut them back in the spring peel off um, all the dead flowers and leaves that dropped on there and peel off even the top layer of mulch on my ground because it was getting thin anyway. Throw all that stuff in my back underneath my fruit trees and put a new layer on in the spring. And what I would do is put a layer of chicken manure on the ground as my fertilizer, which smells real bad if you leave it uncovered for uh, only half a day or so. It smells real bad. A uh, layer about half inch thick underneath my roses, and then a thicker layer to stop the weeds of something like cedar mulch. Now cedar mulch are pushing more now because this is also has some in insecticidal qualities to it. That's why you have cedar chest, kills the moths that fly in there. And since thrips uh, pupate in the dirt, if they hit the cedar mulch, it might kill them. So that might help with the thrips but uh, put that on top of the chicken manure and that combination would feed my roses the entire year. You don't have to do anything else. So chicken manure doesn't even list what's on it, but you put a lot on there, you know, compared to anything else, if you put a half inch layer on there, that's a lot of manure underneath that plant. And even though the uh, nutrition is fairly low concentration, it's enough and it keeps them going for the entire year. So. That's one way to do it. 
Um, this one's more concentrated. You put on less, but you do it at least every three months. Of course, you can always put on less every month or even a little tiny pinch every day if you wanted to do the same thing. Um, <clears throat> at the nursery, when we start our roses, we use this because it works faster and it works for a long time. This is Osmocote chemical fertilizer uh, labeled for six months. So it's just easier for us here because in a pot, if we put an organic fertilizer in the pot and you water it, it flushes it out. So this one kind of stays in the dirt better for us. For our own purposes here, Osmocote, we do that once. And then if we have to fertilize them again, we, we often go to the organic after that. And this, the chem, this one, this particular chemical fertilizer, along with this Magnum, See, in the old days, I used to use Grow Power, which is an organic-based chemical fertilizer. But if, or Grow Power only has like four minerals in it. So after about a year of that, I noticed one or two of my rows would start getting chlorotic. The leaves would get yellow or white or whatnot, and you'd have to figure out what it was. It was off an iron, but you'd have to figure out what it was when you use those products. Uh, when, you, when I switched to organics in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, we never saw any more chlorosis. So if you if you go with the organics, because organics, you know, this is just a dead plant. So all the minerals are there that that plant needs. All 17 minerals are in there. Chicken manure has all 17 also, uh, because they mix chicken manure with compost, so it's got everything in it. Um, the grow power only had five minerals listed. So when you only have five listed after using that for about a year, you're missing something. So you have to work, be careful. Now this one does have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is now of the 17 minerals that plants are made out of. Uh, we don't think about four of them because it's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, and nickel. Nickel's in everything. Don't have to add it. Carbon, hydrogen, uh, oxygen are in water and air. So we don't think about those either. You're always applying those. Uh, but you have to worry about 12 more. This has got 10, and this has got a little, uh, it's got, it's got 10 also. So there's very little missing out of these, because the miners that they're missing, you don't need much. So these, you probably won't see a, a, a nutritional problem unless you're in a pot. In the ground, usually the ground will have what these are missing. But it's always good to go organic or put, at least put a, a compost on the ground to give them the rest of the stuff. Yes. That's when I cut my roses back. Fine now, too. It still works. Yeah, we don't freeze here, so everything keeps on working. If your soil gets real cold in the winter, things stop working. Of course, the plants stop growing, too. That's the nice thing about organics is they work faster when the warmer it gets and plants grow faster when the warmer it gets. So it's all at the same time, same rate. So when you cut back in April, how much do you cut? Can you cut too much or no? Not really. Um, I mean, generally, I would cut my hybrid tea shorter down to about a foot or even a little bit less mm -hmm. because I wanted fewer, thicker canes. My floribundas, which are shorter roses, I would leave them taller because you want more flowers, uh, not fewer larger flowers, but you want more smaller flowers. And so I'd leave them, actually leave them taller with more canes on them, maybe eight, ten canes on those, and on the hybrid teas, three to five canes, and cut them shorter. Which seems the opposite of what you do want to do, but that's what on hybrid teas, the, more, the, the shorter you cut them, the longer the stems grow and the bigger the flowers get. So that's what the florists do is, when the florists cut a rose, they cut, instead of cutting down to the, at least that's what they tell us, so on a stem, instead of cutting down to the first five leaflet leaf on the stem, they cut it to the last five leaflet leaf on the stem, which on a plant in the ground would usually be near the dirt. And that forced them to grow a long stem again, but they want the longest stem possible, which makes the biggest flower too. So, and roses tend to make their biggest flowers uh, after a cool, you know, when they're growing slower in the winter time. 
So in December you can get these huge flowers all the way through about April. You get your biggest flowers on your rows. In the summer when they're growing fast, the flowers come out smaller. So. Do you generally prune back your um, smaller branches and leave just the larger ones, or does that matter? Are there certain ones that you should be cutting out when you're... Pruning? Yeah, if it's real skinny, they're not going to bloom at all. You know, if they're thinner than a pencil, right, if they're thinner than a pencil, I mean, if it's your only branch left, you have to keep it, but if you have other options, then you'd cut off, you know, so on rows, generally, you look for the dead stuff first, get rid of all that. Then you look for anything with disease marks on it and try to clip that part of the plant off if it's diseased. And then you see what's left, and then you say, okay, I want to get rid of the old stuff if I can and keep the new stuff. I mean, sometimes roses refuse to make new canes, and that's a problem. I had one rose, uh, Princess of Monaco, that refused to make any new canes ever. So I had worked with this old cane for 10 years. I just had this one cane on there that would branch out and make flowers on it. It never would make any new ones. But some roses make 20 or 30 a year, like uh, Olympiad would sometimes make 20 or 30 new canes every year. So by summer, I can cut off every stem from the last year. Just have yeah, brand new stems. To right. Just, just get. Yeah, you work with certain rows to do certain things better, so you kind of learn the rows itself. So I had this one, I think it's iceberg, but it has a big clump in the center. They said it was because they didn't prune it right, or is that just... Mm. Well, again, there's no rules anymore because they found out that, you know, um, chainsaw is going to do just as good a job <laughs> as a rosarian, so it, it's... <laughs> You know, and if you get to an old timer, then they'll tell you you want an open vase, no crossing branches, all that stuff. But apparently, it doesn't make any difference. So, what happens if you have a rose that plant, and the plant is gorgeous and beautiful, and all kinds of stems, and it never blooms? I've not had. I've had one rose on it. And well, the plant is healthy and beautiful, but there's no roses. <clears throat> No, either the chili thrips are, are taking all the buds off. Now, you can also have uh, a sucker. So most rows that we get are still grafted onto uh, rootstock. Mm -hmm. This stem on this plant's rootstock. This is called Dr. Huey rootstock. <clears throat> and a lot of times, like the bottom of this rose is also Dr. Huey. Sometimes you get new growth that comes out of that, and it's so strong because it's the rootstock that everything else dies off. Or if sometimes the top of the plant dies for some reason, the rootstock just takes off and grows. Well, the Dr. Huey doesn't bloom except once a year. So we see a lot of roses out there right now that haven't bloomed since spring, uh, and they won't because that rose is only blooms once a year and then every they cut it back in the winter and then you get a few flowers in spring and that's it again. You don't get any flowers the rest of the year. So that could be one thing that could be. You can bring a sample of the foliage and we can look at it and see if it's Dr. Huey rootstock that's actually growing. Could be the chili thrips are messing up everything that comes out. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, otherwise it'd have to bloom. I mean, if you have, if you replace the rose with another rose so the plant's real sick, then it won't grow too well and it won't bloom well at all. A pot, a huge pot, a big pot. Well, and could be the friends. soil so bad that it, I used, uh, we used ours, okay. <laughs> so it's a good soil. It's just as weird. The plant is beautiful and healthy. Well, you have it. I, I got it with Jackson and Perkins last year as one of their roses. We have seen some rose growers send us rootstock. So it's possible they send you a rootstock that it wasn't, you know, roses can lose their graft and what grows from it sometimes is not the rose at all but rootstock. That's what it's, it looks like. It's possible. You can bring us a branch and we'll take it out. Because we've had, we had one rose this last year that we got from a grower and we noticed it wasn't, uh, it was just all rootstock. So that's possible. I mean, Jackson Perkins is not the company they used to be, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so water, how much yeah. water does it? Well, they like to always be wet. Oh. 
So the people who uh, grow roses for a hobby and really want to get the maximum they can water daily. Now, all of the farm industry has found out that daily irrigation is more efficient than weekly or bi-weekly or any other form of irrigation. If you water a little bit every day, it's, it's always more efficient than if you water heavy every two days or real heavy every three or every four. So, yeah, just because you're watering every day doesn't really ca cause you to waste water. And, f and if anything, it helps you save water. We don't know why the water district doesn't tell people to water just a little bit every day because that's apparently what saves water, <laughs> not watering once a week. If you want a roast to be happy, you got to water. Well, you want to keep the moisture level as even as you can. Yeah. So watering a little bit every day is the best. Uh, now, this time of year, you know, if, if the daytime temperature is only going to hit 60, the plant's not using any water. So plants don't use any water below 55. And on a 60 degree day, about uh, four or five hours may be above 55. <laughs> so essentially this time of year, if you watered once every two weeks with this weather, and if it rains once a week, you don't have to do any watering at all. Um, and if it's below 75 in the day, we, you just don't even think about it. But once you get above 75, so April through November, or through October, uh, generally you pretty much water every day, but between November and April you may not have to water at all if we get rain during that time. So, Now the other way to check, you want the rose roots to always be moist, and what that means is if you have a piece of rebar, which is, you know, if you get a 3 8 inch rebar, it'll be a little thicker than this wire here. See how far you can push in the ground. If you can push it in the ground a foot to a foot and a half, fine, you're moist enough. If you can't push it down a foot, the ground's too dry. Farmers used to check. Before farmers had computers, they would walk around with a piece of rebar about this long with the, with the L handle on it. You can find those at um, Home Depot. And you just push it as hard as you can on the ground. If you can push in a foot, you're moist enough. If you cannot push in a foot to a foot and a half, you're too dry up the water a little bit. Otherwise, the rose just stops growing. It wasn't kill it. Roses we found uh, handled the drought years pretty well. We didn't lose that many. And we saw flax plants and daylilies dying in the parks, but the roses stood their ground. So uh, even though they don't like to be dry, they don't seem to need a whole bunch of water. But for best results, lots of water. So hard to overwater a rose. If it stays swampy, you got trouble. So we had a spot in our yard that was staying muddy, and the roses sat there and sulked. So what we did with it is we redid the bed, put in um, like one block high, and put four inches more dirt in there, and replant the roses in new soil, and that became our best rose bed. This raising up four inches off the mud uh, really helped them out. <clears throat> so it doesn't take much, but they should drain well. Any other questions on care? I have one question. I was saying the roses get that sort of woody. Is there a time that you take them out and just start over if you have an ingested plot? Or True. Kind of well, they... In the center, right. Really yeah, so roses do get old, so... Yeah, well, they say roses should do well for at least 10 years. And some people have roses for 40. So 10 years uh, is about as good as we expect them to do well. And after that, you can pull them out and put new ones in. Because, uh, you know, the older wood doesn't make new growth very well. So yeah, so again, if you, again, if you do replace them, then you gotta replace the dirt too. Um, let's see if I've covered everything here. So you mentioned that you're out of the bare roses. Well, the bare roses will be here. I was trying to make lists for you this morning of what's coming, but our internet went out this morning for uh, some reason. My, all my computer shut down. <laughs> but we ha have a list of roses that are, this one register over here, few copies at least of the rose we're getting. 
If you get our emails, uh, if you sign up on our emails, you get those rows lists too. And it did change a couple weeks ago. We put, added a few more new roses to that list. So if you haven't opened up that one lately, there's a few new roses on it. Um, and those will be here. Uh, they said they're shipping on the week of the 10th. So that's uh, not this coming week, but the week after. And it'll take us a few days to process. If you purchase a rose, and as we take the rose out of the box, we save the nicest ones for the people who've already prepaid for them. We're actually out of a few roses already. And our company told us one of our most popular roses, Yves Piaget, is a, is a crop failure. I mean, we're really, we told them, well, if you find any at all, send them over because we've got a lot of people wanting that rose and already paid for Yves Piaget, but uh, crop failure on that one. Last year we had crop failures on uh, four or five different roses. Uh, and the rose growers keep getting smaller, so we have fewer and fewer roses to choose from every year, too. So. Are they all about similar price points? Seventeen ninety. No, I think we have a few at fourteen ninety nine, but most of them are seventeen ninety nine to twenty four ninety nine. So when they when they make new roses, they usually patent them, and the patented roses raise the price by quite a bit. So they're usually uh, over well seventeen ninety nine for all the non patents. And everything that's patented is uh, higher than that. And are you getting any of the flooring on this? Mm-hmm. Um, is it potting? How, it says potting soil. Mm -hmm. So you can use that in pots and the ground. Right. If the potting soil is done properly, it can be used anywhere. Most potting soils, I would tell you, do not use them in the ground or even in a pot. <laughs> <laughs> but yours can be used, so you don't have two separate kinds. No. One for pots and one for Yeah, we expect our soil to work both ways. Okay. When you I'm say if it's done properly, what do you mean? Well, most potting soils, you know, the, the crime in our country is that if you look up the EPA's definition of a potting soil, because they control what's being sold, what you can sell, is a mixture of wood compost and something else. It's like, why would a plant want to grow in a dead ground up tree? But that's what all the potting soils are made out of. They're all, well, not all. Uh, there's a few out there. Uh, occasionally, Miracle Grow makes one without ground up wood, and, and Sun Grow makes several without ground up wood, and Fox Farm even makes some without ground up wood. But almost every potting soil you see out there, the main ingredient is ground up tree. And now roses are very tolerant. They'll grow in it for a while and they'll actually look okay. But a lot of plants, you put them in that, they rot immediately because that's what it is. It's a dead body of a plant. And for some reason, even the academia of the country thinks that if there's no dead tree in there, the soil is poor nutrition. Well, the problem is that I don't know what's wrong with their minds, but it's not the home of plants. Uh, they're leaving out one whole step, which is that fungus and bacteria live on dead stuff. And when they get through with it, then the, that becomes nutrition for the plants. You can't put a plant directly in a dead tree. It doesn't like it very well, but here, all the potting soils you buy are dead tree. They say we recycle forest products. It's just whatever they can't sell at the lumber yard as lumber, they sell you as potting soil. And uh, our, our, we found that out 25 years ago that that wasn't right. And that's why everything died in pots, is <laughs> because they don't like dead trees. So. Um, should you be pruning back vining uh, roses like climbing? Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. So, climbing roses like this can be considered a climber. Generally, for up to five years, the stems make good roses so and you don't need to trim back at all you can clean off the dead leaves you know you clean off right so just clean them up clean them off disease portions of it and stuff like that but leave the stems after they get older and they start forming that gray bark clip them off because they don't bloom as well after that but you don't cut those back at all like you do don't have to in fact, uh, you know, there was articles in the LA Times in the 80s saying, why do we cut back roses at all? You know, the, uh, back east they have to do it, or up north, because the winter just kills off half the plant, and they have to clean it up and get rid of all the dead stuff. 
but here there really isn't any reason. You, can, you, you know, mainly it's for disease. I mean, if we had a purpose, it's to get rid of the rust and the black spot. Clean up the rows once a year. If if it's you know if it's if there's not much disease on it, you don't have to do anything. Because there have been years at my house where it was so dry in the winter, we didn't bother cutting them back. There was not enough disease to worry about. Now, I could go over varieties. I don't even here want to hear about varieties. Uh, otherwise, it's on our catalog list. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you said this wasn't telecast today, but is it uh, on YouTube? Do you put it on YouTube later? Uh, I think I did a class about two months ago that's on there with the same subject. So it should be on on YouTube. So if, right. So on, if you go on YouTube and you just enter Gary's Best Gardening, and it'll find it'll bring up a list of our class. There's maybe 20 on there, maybe 30 by now.